Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? It is I, Van Lathan. And it's me, Rachel Lindsay. So we're actually two minutes and 50, 50 seconds into this podcast already because yes. I was talking, but for some reason, it probably was Bozeman. The My connection to my Zoom recorder was loose. And so the levels weren't coming through, but I noticed it and we had to start over a second. Don't do that to Bozeman. This is all you. You didn't have it plugged in. You didn't check your levels before we started. He's a playful dog. We're a little rusty. We're used to doing two shows a week. You know, we've we've whittled it down to one for the holidays. We're back now. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Rachel. Yeah, we we were talking about something. We were talking about something. We were talking about um, an experience we both just had, right? Because we taped a promo for a podcast which will already have happened by the time you're listening to this. Me and Rachel, later on, today is Monday as we tape this. We're going to be on Bachelor Party Live with Juliet Littman to talk about the first season of The Bachelor, right? The first season of me watching The Bachelor. All right, it's not the first season of The Bachelor, but first season I've actually watched. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking about old Matt James. I watched the first episode. I got a lot of thoughts about Matt James. The first episode was weird. Vibrators, tiaras, all kinds of stuff. A bunch of weirdos. But anyway, so we're going to talk about that. But uh, one of our colleagues at The Ringer who taped this for us, he was, a, he was working on another different show, has the coolest name I've heard in a while. Okay. His name is Mose Bergman. Mose. That's his guy's and, name. And is that his real name or is it a nickname? No, his real name is you Mose asked. Bergman. And why is it so cool to you, Van? Because it's just like, it's a it's a name. To me, like I said before, I'll, I'll retell it. It's not good. That's good the second time. But to me, well, it's, it's good either, the first time. Y'all. It was fucking great. <laughs> to me, it's either Mose Bergman, either you're like a jazz trumpeteer, like you're a trumpet player in a jazz band, okay. or you're like a private detective. Like get Mose Bergman on the case. On the case. <laughs> you know? It's like there's a killer roaming around Hollywood. There's only one man who can solve it. It's Mose Bergman. But here's the problem. Mose Bergman, before he had to leave the force. Why? Because the captain was limiting him. He didn't like his unorthodox ways and tactics. So now the only hope to solve the case of the Tinseltown terror is Mose Bergman. I feel like when you call Mose, he's sitting at the bar with a basket of peanuts next to oh. him. You know what I mean? And Cook. like a, a disheveled suit. Cook. With like, you like this? Yes. Keep cooking. <laughs> Cook. Oh, oh, that's what that means? Yes. He's sitting there talking to talking to Joe behind the bar. Yeah. Nobody's around him. Maybe like the local bum, maybe at the at the corner. Uh, he's got his his whiskey on the rocks mm. there. And he's like. Pour me up another one, Right. Joe. Pour, pour me up another one, Joe. And then yeah. this is the scene where Moses' old partner, who is actually now the captain, okay, comes into the bar. And he's like, really, Moses? You don't think that a man of your... Death, shut up! Either you're drinking or you're getting out of my face. Choose one. Sure, I'll have a drink. Hey. <laughs> Joe. I remember, when, Joe, <laughs> give us two of them. Moses' life has gone off the rails since he's left the force. You know what I mean? Yeah. His life yeah, yeah. is, yeah, the bum is really Moses' only friend. Mm-hmm. Moses is the only guy that looks after him. But yeah. this, throughout, through tracking down the Tinseltown terror, right? Yeah. You know, this is going to bring Moses and his old partner back together. Moses is going to find the meaning of life and career in this new case. And this is, no, 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 this is the thing. The Tinseltown Terror is a cold case. Oh, wow. It's a cold case. And this is why he and his partner, this is why he left the force. Oh, cool. But cook. now he's, he's, it's back. He's it's killing back again. again. He's killing again. So Moe's has this new, he's like, you know what? I'm you gotta back. get him. He takes, a, he takes a shot, not whiskey, scotch. Takes, scotch. Takes the scotch back to the head, mm-hmm. slams the glass down. You can hear the pool balls. That's probably not what they're called. But the balls. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, I don't know what else they're called. You, yeah, hear the clack, you hear them clack in the back, and he's Weird. like, I'm ready. I'm ready. Because I'm ready. this is the, that's so much better. You're so good at this. Mose was killing it. The Tinseltown Terror 
that is what made Mose go haywire. Yeah. Because he was too yeah. obsessed with the case. Yeah. But the Tinsel Town Terror stopped. Mose couldn't catch him, like you said. Mose comes back later, and now he's got to finish. Mose has got to finish. Mose Bergman. Man. This is we good. just wrote a script. We wrote a script. In, in scene. In scene. What era, before we leave this, what <laughs> era, what era does this take place during? Like what era? If, I, if I'm going to give it, I, 80s? 80s, 80s, yeah. 80s. 80s, right? because then the partner can be black. Anytime before then. <laughs> <laughs> like, so true. Anytime, like literally, people understand about like what it's like to be black. Like we have to set the movie in period, right? But you can't do it in the 60s, right? Can't do it even really in the 70s. That's not why I said You definitely can't do it in the 50s, all right? I said 80s because I was thinking like technology, like the system isn't up yet. They don't really have computers mm-hmm. like that. I just see right. him like going through papers, going through old files. The evidence wasn't to get, you know what I mean? Like yeah. he's really got to hit the ground running to solve the case. It's true. But if it was in the 50s, his partner would be his chauffeur. <laughs> Hey, hey, Danny, we got to go out, you know. Yeah. Mose Bergman. You. Mose Bergman and the Tinseltown Terror. <laughs> it's I'm good. I want to watch it. Yeah, I will watch it too. Damn. See, we, that's what I'm talking about. When, we, when, you, when, you're, when you're at home and you're going stir crazy, you're 15 pounds heavy, and there's nothing else for you to do, these are the things you can really come up with great, great art. I'm yeah. Into- I'm into it. Yeah, now, what did Diddy say? If the if if you didn't hustle this year, it ain't in you. Yeah, come on. I love you, Puff, Puff. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. I love you. Puff, Puff is my man. Me and Puff are working together, but I'm hustling my ass back and forth to therapy. We we don't always we don't always uh you know get it mm-hmm. right every time. That one wasn't it. All right, I gotta ask you a question, and mm-hmm. this is a very straightforward question. Got it. Straightforward question, and I will ask you. Right after this break. Rachel, I'm sure you like the Black Eyed Peas, right? What's your favorite Black Eyed Peas song? Oh, gosh. I mean, I'm not like a huge fan. Maybe um, Let's Get It Started. I'm just picking mm. one. Let's Get It Started. I'm just picking one. It's Where a controversial song. It's a controversial song. Did you know that? No. Gosh, of it, course I picked that one. Why is it controversial? Because the name of that song was actually Let's Get the R Word. Did you know this? Shut up. That was the name of that song. Initially, the song was Let's Get And they R-word. recorded it that way and everything. Let's Get R Word in here. Are you? I'm Googling this. Are you serious? He, he's right, yeah. No, he, don't. No, right. Jackson. No. Jackson, I don't need you Who's to come dumb in. Whose idea was that? Okay, I, I changed my mind. Jackson, my favorite Black I don't guy. need you to come in because I'm sick of being taken like the stuff that I say is tall tales. Well, it's not that. It's just that it's so crazy that you would even think that that's okay. And now the song is such a hit. I take it back. It's That's the joint. It was like, that's let's the get jam. our Turn word. Turn it up and play it again. That's, that's the song. song. That's the one. That's I go back. I, I, I picked that jam, one. It's the jam. It's the jam. It's the jam. I can see the video in my head and everything, right? The they were in the camera. Remember, they were like, that's the yeah. joint. And then they they like, the video went, the, the song was like two minutes long. Then the song went off. And for the next like five minutes in the video, they just danced weirdly. <laughs> And I was in college. I was like, yo. <laughs> That's why they weren't on yet. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, <laughs> they think they're getting off with this? Like, I, I don't think they're getting off. That's I don't why think. they weren't on. You know? And that was a weird... And remember, because this is like maybe 99, 2000, it was a high bar of dance that I was used to Yeah. at that point, you know? So it was like, that was when Usher was doing his thing and you had the boy bands out there that were killing it. I just think they were mm, they were mm. they were just a different group back then, right? They were cool. like uh, backpack kids. I like uh, before we get into the topic. I'm not gonna lie. I kind of like uh, there's two. They got one that's uh, they got one, and it's they got CeeLo on it, and they got a bunch of people on it. It was like a uh, damn. What's the name of that song, man? It's like it was like a real jazz melodic joint with uh, I don't know. Damn, CeeLo is on the song. I, I gotta find it. Cause it's like uh they were actually, it's actually like a hip hop joint. 
like a real hip hop joint. CeeLo. Is it one of their beginning? Nah, they, they were blown up because Fergie was with them uh, by this point. Black Eyed Peas. Uh, Black Eyed Peas. Oh no, what the hell? This is not. Am I am I not thinking about? Oh, it's like it's called like that. It's the Black Eyed Peas featuring Q Tip, John Legend, and Talib oh, Kweli. Q Tip. Yeah, that song I used to dig a lot. Um, but I'll say this: besides that joint, it was just straight up my humps. You know what I'm saying? So, so but is that Black Eyed Peas? Really? I thought that was just Fergie's song for some reason. No, that's a Black Eyed Peas song. Okay. It's a stupid song, but it's fun. It is now, fun. This is, the reason why we're talking about the Black Eyed Peas is because Will I Am recently said something that I thought was very interesting. It's a it's something that leads to a deeper cultural conversation. All right, and I love questions like that that lead to a deeper cultural conversation where we can understand each other and share ideas. Uh, he says that the Black Eyed Peas got so big mm-hmm. that they are not considered a black act. They're not a black band. They're not a black group. It's not black culture because they got so big. And he says that's a shame because the black community should be able to take credit for how big the black eyed peas did and everything that the black eyed peas are about. He feels like they got so big, they crossed over so much that that's not the truth. Do you think, when you think of the black eyed peas, do you think of them as a black act? Um. Hmm. Okay, I'm 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 pausing because I'm thinking pausing. you asked you asked the question in an interesting way. Cause I would say yes and no. I think of them as a black act because they're black, but do I think of their music necessarily in the genre of being like urban? No. But hmm. I looked them up, okay, because I, I, you know, I saw what Will I Am said, and 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 I thought it was more of an excuse. And I know we're going to get deeper into it, but they've been nominated for NAACP awards. They've been nominated and won. They've been nominated for BET awards mm-hmm. and won. So obviously, they are considered a black group, and it's in a rap division or best group division. Mm-hmm that they're getting this credit. So, yes, is my general answer. Now, do you feel like you have to be black to be nominated for an NAACP award or or a a BET award? I think most people who are nominated are black. I would say 99% of them that are nominated are. I don't think you have to be. I'm sure, I I know that there are people who aren't black who've been nominated, but majority of them are. And so I'm saying that to say, They've been recognized by black award shows for their work. So they have been considered to be black, which is why I laugh at what Will I Am says, because I feel like it's just an, a scapegoat and he's not really getting to the issue of it. He's putting the blame on other people when maybe the blame should be turned on self. Hmm. Self. Interesting. Um, Iggy Azalea, just to let you know, has been nominated for two BET awards. There you go. Iggy. Iggy, 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 Iggy. I'm sure M has too. I'm sure M has won some. Um, but look, so I don't know. Like, I never thought about whether or not the Black Eyed Peas I were never did either. Black. <laughs> I never thought about it. Because it's it makes no difference. Who cares? Like, first of all, you know, the Black Eyed Peas have a long history. Did you know that they were signed back in the day to Ruthless Records? Easy E signed them. It's a true fact. No, and I believe you. I'm not even going to say, let me Google it. Exactly. I believe you. Exactly. Easy E signed them. I think the deeper question to this is specifically what does it mean when you say black, right? Okay. And that's something that's interesting because black is both who you are and what you do. And very few other cultures, and I'm not going to speak for them, Actually, that's not true. Most other cultures have mm-hmm. that same litmus test. Mm-hmm. You can be Mexican and you can also do things that Mexicans do. 
If you do that, you're doing something that Mexicans do. There's Mexican music. That is what culture is, right? I think um, the only thing is that I remember back in the day when I was at TMZ, um, we were talking about rappers. And I said, rap is black music. Mm-hmm. Black, the music is ours. Mm-hmm. And everybody at TMZ was like, ah, no, it's not. It's like the, the music is like whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Blacks and Latinos started hip hop. Mm-hmm. So it's like the music is ours. And everybody was getting down on me. And my friend uh, who worked with me at the time there, Itai Hod, said, listen, I agree with you. Uh, he's Israeli. He goes, anybody can play Israeli music, but if you play Israeli music, you're playing Israeli music. Mm-hmm. Their music. So, their music, right? So I guess the question is not is whether or not the Black Eyed Peas, whether or not they are Black. The question is, is their music Black music? Yeah. And the answer is, I mean, yeah, because there's not a piece of music that Black people don't do. I mean, there's not, there's not well, one... Well, would you say we do pop? Yeah. Would you say that's ours? Well, no, no, no. What I'm saying is that, well, Michael Jackson is Black music, is it not? I knew you were going to use Michael as an example, but I... I could, um, I could use countless people. Whitney, early Whitney Houston, yeah. But really, to be honest with you, I could say that Black people invented pop music. Who would you say invented pop music? I mean, who's the artist that you first affiliate pop mu- associate pop music to? It depends on what you mean by pop. And this, this is what I'll say. I'll say that the first big, huge music that was big on radio, right, mm-hmm. were, it was mostly white acts covering black music, right? Absolutely. So, or or even if it's Elvis Presley or any person like that, that's still black music that he's doing and it's pop music. Uh, it was th- Elvis pop? I don't consider, I don't, I don't even know well, when pop really it's gonna, started. I, it's pop music. By default, Elvis Presley is going to be a pop music artist just because of how popular the songs were. Okay. Now, if you talk about pop as a genre, right, once right, again, right. new edition, whoever, Mm-hmm. Like all of those people are going to take their cues and influences from us. It's like there's no part of music in America mm-hmm. that black people haven't influenced. So, did you see the interview that Kim Hill did? Kim Hill, who used to be the singer for the Black Eyed Peas? Yes. They kicked her right to the curb, put the white lady in. Yes, yes. go ahead. So, mm-hmm. she did an interview, which is very interesting, which you haven't listened to it, you should go, because she's re- been pretty silent except for an article that she did, I believe, in 2019 with the New York Times about her time with the Black Eyed Peas. And she discusses how they moved away from their Black audience, from the what they used to be when they were doing That's the Joint, That's the Jam, or when they had her as the lead uh, singer. And once they put Fergie in, they moved to pop culture to gain or attract a bigger audience. So they moved away from their core audience, the audience who you could say put them on the map, who gave them their start to attract a bigger audience that didn't necessarily look Black. And she comes from this place of you neglected the community that helped you. You took out the Black woman and replaced them with a white woman. And even in this interview that's at issue that we're talking about, he says that the Black Eyed Peas started in 2004. I don't know why he says that when that Ella Funk album came out in 2002, which had Fergie on it. But he totally disregards the fact that she was a part of this group and this group had was a part of a whole genre, a blacker genre, before they became, they gained popularity. So I think the argument on the other side of it is don't use the fact that you gained international success and attracted a bigger audience when that's what you were going for as a scapegoat when the reality is you purposely tried to attract that type of audience and moved away from what you really are. And even when you talk, or what you started as, and when you talk about the group, even so now, you disregard its origins, which were rooted in blackness. And that's why people don't consider you a black group because of where you started and where you are now. You know, mm. if you did a, 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 a how's, it, how's it going, for how it started versus how it's going, you could really do that with the black eyed peas and it would look totally different. That's why people question their blackness, not because they gain international success, which is why I have a problem with what uh, Will I Am said in that interview. Yeah, I don't think anybody questions Usher's blackness because Confession sold 10 million copies. Right. I, I will say that there is, 
a slight difference here. Even in That's the Joint Just Jam, when you looked at them, it was obvious that they were very eclectic, right? They eclectic, dr- they, yeah. They, dr- they dress differently. The members, like Apple and some of these other guys, they like they look differently. They're biracial. So there were some things that were different about them already. When they came back with the Where's the Love joint, which has two versions, I guess there's one with Fergie and then one with Justin Timberlake. At first, I didn't even know it was the Black Eyed Peas because the music... I didn't either. ...sounded nothing like it. And when I saw Fergie walking with them, I thought she was a featured artist. Sure. It wasn't until they kept going that, you know, because it sounded completely different. I don't think... First of all, nobody is asking this question. That's the first thing. This is something that Will I Am has sitting on his heart. <laughs> right. and, my, and And brother, <laughs> if you got something sitting on your heart, let's talk about it. But I can't remember the last time I was in a conversation with members of the quote-unquote community, and they were mad about what the Black Eyed Peas did. Nobody. The Black Eyed Peas have gotten a pretty easy go of it as far as the community. They do whatever they want. We don't care. Like, we're not, we're not tripping about... I mean, maybe... We, does Will I Am want to be invited to more things? Does he want... I think that he wants to be affiliated. It, that's what it felt like to me. When you talk about what he wanted to get off his chest, I think he's upset that he's not considered more you know, like down with the black folks. Maybe he's not invited to certain things. Maybe that's what it is. Because I do look at them as just more pop than I do with how they started. There is a huge difference. It's a weird thing. It would be as if, it's like, shout out to Jason Derulo, right? Right. But Jason Derulo... But he's always been that way. I know. It was whatever. The point is, the, the My Humps situation, they're not playing that at the barbecue. Like, they're not, they're not rocking my humps. It's not going to happen. But I don't think anyone would not let Will I Am in. I think this is a personal right. thing that Will I Am has going on with himself. So, so you think maybe he feels that way because what they did was intentional. They intentionally changed who they were to attract a greater audience. Yeah, but it happens. A lot of people do that. And there's nothing wrong with it. But I think that that's where he's coming from, where you think of when you give a Jason Derulo or you name another pop artist— did they start off one way and change who they were to gain the masses, to become mm-hmm. this international group that, I mean, they're technically one of the best-selling groups of all times. I didn't even know all of that. Why did you say technically? I mean, because I don't know who the, they're one of the best is what I should say. I'm not sure who is the best. So I, I that's think why that I don't you're know. having a lot of problems giving don't the Black Eyed Peas their flowers. Don't put that on me. It's a techni- it no sounds to me like Will I Am is feeling a certain way because of... You know, yeah, he felt because well, that's what that's what Kim Hill says. She basically says they sold out. All right, so Will I Am, one of the joint joints and jams was on the Woolworth soundtrack. This is freshman year I of love college. That song. Like, turn it up and play it again. That's the joint, that's the jam. And then you know what? They came back again with a second album in, 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 uh, I guess, like this was in not in 2000. Mm-hmm. That, shit, that shit didn't go anywhere. Yeah, you know? I think th- I think maybe that's when they had Macy Gray on. They had, they had Macy maybe Gray, it was a, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that didn't go anywhere. So they were like, we're not doing this no more. 2002, they auditioned Nicole Scherzinger. I saw I'm that. Reading. And then they, uh, <laughs> Nicole was just going, Nicole and Fergie were just bouncing around until one of them popped. <laughs> and, and then they, uh, they came back with Ella Funk and then that was it. But look, look, look. I, I, I always wonder about stuff like this. Because I tell you something, man. There's no love like the love of black people. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that there's no love. Do you know why? why? Because people can have so much. But if they don't have that, they drove a body. You're saying if black people don't have the love of yeah, black people. Yeah, if black people don't have the black the love of black people, they drove a body. There's not enough out there besides that that can make you happy. If you don't have the love of black people, if you don't have the love of your community, mm. you know, because I they can like, speak from personal experience. I know. <laughs> have you felt that? Are you kidding me? I was so disappointed that when I was doing media for the Black Bachelorette, I didn't do and 
for all I know. For the Black Bachelorette. That's not the name I, of the show. I, I didn't mean, I didn't mean <laughs> that. I meant the show. <laughs> As the Black Bachelorette. Oh! As the Black Bachelorette. <laughs> like, Rachel has renamed the show. When I was doing media for the Black Bachelorette. <laughs> As the Black Bachelorette. I was so hurt that I didn't do, like, the Ricky Smiley show or the Breakfast Club or... You know, just um, Ebony, B- BET wrote an article about me when I was announced, and they wrote a nasty article about me at the end of my finale, which I was extremely vocal on, which I got uh, in trouble for. So I, I, I was upset that the community, and then I had to think about it. Did Rachel watch the show before she was on it? Mm-hmm. No. Did Rachel right. care about it? No. So why am I, I guess I just thought seeing the that a black woman actually was held the like finally broke through that they would be more supportive. So I I understand, I guess, Will, in that sense, that you want that. You want your people to feel proud for you. You want your people to love what you're doing and to support you and uplift you. And when you don't have it and you want that, because not everybody wants it, Mm -hmm. but when you do want it, it hurts. So here's the most enduring thing about Black people. Mm -hmm. Black people care about what they care about. (laughs) And it ain't no telling why. There's no rhyme or reason to it. They care about what they care about. There's a feeling. I'm I'm sure every culture has this. There's a feeling, right? A feeling. You look, you feel it. When you're around, when you're enveloped in it, when you're a part of it, there's a feeling. And as long as that feeling is there, you feel comfortable, you feel counted, you feel amongst people, it's all love. But if anything interrupts the frequency that transmits that feeling, (laughs) you ain't it. And I'm sorry, the Black Eyed Peas haven't made one song that gives you that feeling. And I'm telling about the feeling is all across the the spectrum, by the way. The feeling is, the feeling can can be a spectrum from knuck if you buck all the way to the greatest love of all. It's a wide spectrum. Sure, 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 sure. By the way, it's some white people that give you the feeling. You know? You if you name want some? Robin Thicke, Lost Without You. Put that record on. Lost Without You. Can't help myself. Oh, yes. That Did feeling. it help that he had a black woman as the lead or you would just still be feeling it regardless? That's how he got the feeling. You can't write a song about a white woman like that. You're right. Like, Let's talk about Robin Thicke. When he's saying, I get you alone with that long hair riding that bicycle in the mm-hmm. street. Right. We weren't. We weren't dealing with Robin. Right. We weren't. We, we weren't. weren't. See, then he changed. He, he changed. He changed. They had been together for a long time, so I don't know if he was denying it, though. <laughs> he, he hasn't been together for a long time. But, but it's look, music. You see what I'm saying? He came. Look, it, it's like you write songs about white women like Richard Marks. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's a song that was written, you know, Burt Bacharach. You know? And don't get me wrong, some, these songs are great. Frank Sinatra. Ain't for that her, a kick in the head? <laughs> ain't, th- ain't that a kick in the head? I'm- Loving your Frank Sinatra. I love that song, but that's like a that's like a that's like a, a song that a white dude would write about his girl. He's in what love. What about Matt King Cole? He's black. I know, but he was in that genre. No, it does sound different. It sound different. Okay. Unforgettable. That's what you are. That's why, darling. And then he came back, and Natalie uh, and Natalie. Uh, Natalie Cole got on it with them. The yeah, daughter. they did the duet. It was, it was dope. yes. It was amazing. You know what I'm saying? So it's different. It's different. You know what I mean? It's different. <laughs> it's a feeling. There's nothing wrong with it. You got guys like for I was listening. You know who I was listening to earlier today? What? George who? Michael. Which song? Faith, of course. Faith. No, one I'm more like, try. I be my favorite George Michael song. T- and that's a this. It's different. Like I, you're not gonna really. Like, the sisters I know, they're not going to get the little jitterbug to the acoustic guitar. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. It, but it's dope, though. That shit is so dope. <laughs> it is. It is. And if I could <laughs> turn the heart away, and I know all the games you play. Y'all I make sure y'all too. watch this video. <laughs> yeah, well, watch this video. It's, it's, no, it's no, the, not the Faith video. The video of this, of this podcast. Oh, of me? Oh. I want them to see the joy in your face. 
I love that song. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, if that if the feeling don't come, then I don't know what to tell Will I am. I get it. Listen, I get it. I didn't give them the feeling. Will and the black eyes. No, 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 no. Give you them give the feeling. The feeling. You no, give the but feeling. I, but I but I do understand the desire to want that from the community. You know, so yeah, you can't ask them for it though. You mm-hmm. can only get it when you give something. Well, I gotta I be. I I'll be honest with you. I get be honest with you. I was on TMZ for mad long. Mm-hmm. Mad long. Seven years. Mm-mm. Yay came in. I have the yay thing. Now I was like, oh, look at him. I've been right. doing my same shit on there. But it's like I give them that feeling now we know. They know you now, but we weren't really watching The Bachelor. You might have been, you could have been on The Bachelor wearing a Malcolm X hat doing the I have a dream speech every single day. <laughs> but how are we going to know? All we know is that that show don't really, you know, and it's just, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, it's not that we don't accept Will I Am. No, that like you said, you, you, you said it so well. This yeah. is something that's been on his heart. This is something yeah. he wanted to get off his chest. He's been feeling this way. <laughs> The community hasn't put this on him. We, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know. Like when we, we not playing boom boom pow. Like when I said, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell. Can you imagine? Will, just at your next event, whatever just, it may be, when COVID, when we're done, at, when we're out of this, just drop a black eye. Drop that track. boom boom. Drop that boom and boom. And see pow. how people respond. See how they respond. Like just, just you want to you go in the barbershop and say, yo, man, and, and drop that boom, boom, pow. Because <laughs> remember, Fergie raps on that. Fergie you raps imagine, on Can boom, you boom, imagine pow. people's oh, faces? By the way, Fergie got joints. Uh, what, what was the joint that I love with My Fergie house, and Ludacris? Nah, not oh, that one. Um, um, Fergalicious. Wait, no, is that it? No, 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 no. Fergie had Glamorous polos. life. Oh, Glamorous life. Oh, C-L-A-M-R. All you is is on a bus up in the sky, in the champagne. I can't think about a glamorous. Ooh, the flousey, flousey. Love it. I'm just Love letting you have it. your moment. It's <laughs> dope. That's dope. Fergie, listen. Fergie, Fergie was, went yeah. hard. Fergie For went hard. Real. I'm not, I'm fucking with it. It's good. Do you think Fergie was more accepted? <laughs> When she Fergie, came I'm out lie, with, that, with, the, with those songs, I'm I mean, from lie. my humps, I know that's Black Eyed Peas, but that's what that's what kind of gave her the the jump London start. London Bridge, I think. Fergie London probably, Bridge, Fergie. Fergalicious, glamorous. We we might have been Fergie kind of messing with Fergie a little bit more than the Black Eyed Peas. Fergie probably gonna get in before Will I Am because <laughs> I could drop because because I could I, I I could drop that I could drop that glamorous. And it's going to... Because even if they don't know it first, they're going to be like, oh, okay. But remember, that's Polo the Don. The yeah. Polo the Don. Like, Polo the Don. Fergie got Ludacris on there. Polo the Don. Polo the Don. See, look. Look. I, man, Will, chill, bro. Will, you gre- You good. You good. Bring Fergie back to the Will, group. Okay, here's the thing. Will can come to his barbecue. Of course. We're just not going to play your music in there. I was just about to say that. That's the only thing. That's the only thing. That's the only thing. We'll play something you produced. Yeah. Maybe. Where has he produced? He's Where's got a like, long list of stuff. Let's look. Before okay. we say that. Before we no, say... He do- he, no, he no, does. no, no. No. Hell no. Before we, <laughs> before we say that, before Watch we just be say nothing. that we will put something that Will I Am produced on in the barbecue, let's actually look. Will I there's am a gotta genius. Be, there's got to be one song. Okay. Will I? There's some good ones on this list. I, I, I'm Thank not you. saying that they're not. Jackson. Jackson. I'm not saying that they're not. Oh, my. Well, let's see. Let's he look. He did. Let's see. He got Carlos Santana. He got John. Oh, he got John Legend, Ordinary People. That's playing. Wow. I didn't even know That's he did that. That's a great song. Okay. John Legend, Ordinary People. That's 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 getting played. There you go. You only need one. Ooh, ooh, he got Pussycat Dolls beep. That's a I like that song. I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see. He got some Ricky Martin joints. They not gonna go. Um, I don't know, man. I think 
I think that I think I'm not for me. Oh, Fergalicious is actually what I am. For me, I'm not gonna lie. It seemed like it seemed like the only Will I Am joint we playing is that it's ordinary, ordinary people. people. <laughs> it seemed like. Oh no, he got Nas. Hip hop is dead. He did. He did some I something for the song. game. He did Grand Piano he for did Nicki two Minaj. Songs. I did Compton not know is that. a dope ass song with that. So yeah, he got some. He got some. I'm not taking. Oh, I want you. Uh, on the Find It Forever album for Common. Great. You got some stuff? Okay. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So we stand corrected. Will I am. So there will be some of your music that will be played inside of there. And by the way, this is this is not the black people. We can't speak for all black people. It's some black people listening to this right now that's going, yo, Will I Am is my favorite of all time. I love Will I Am. I don't know no nigga. But, <laughs> but but it's definitely they on there. I'm looking for more. Shout out, man. Shout out, Will I am. I'm glad he's he spoke did. His... Did you know he did the Michael Jackson when they redid the Thriller 25 album? Did know that. Mm. He um, redid PYT. Yeah, he redid. Girl did. is mine. He's. You know what? Let's let's do something real quick. Let's let's do something real quick. Let's just say we love you, Will I am. We love you, Apple. You think he needs to hear that? Yeah, we yeah, love you, Will I am. We love you, Will I am. We, we like do. we we don't want you to feel this way, you know. And we don't have we don't want to have to lie to you, like we checking for that black eyed peas like that. But you are a genius in music. Yes, you are you a black are. man. You do your thing. It's gravy. And by the way, any other black people that feel like they don't really getting a fair shake for the community because there's a lot of people, you know, that feel like they out there and they're not really getting a fair shake. You know? Some of y'all we like. Some, 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 some we don't. <laughs> some, some we don't. By the way, that's how they feel about us. Like, there's, we're not a monolith. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. What that, you, that's what makes, makes us great. Hmm? What, what did you have to do to get in good with the community? Was it? I didn't have to do anything. I I have been unapologetically myself this entire time. I think uh, I think people just started to come around once I was detached from the franchise. Mm. You know what? I take it back. I wrote an article. I wrote an essay a year after the day I was off contract mm -hmm. about my finale and how I felt about it, and that really made the rounds. And started to give me more like, okay, she wasn't happy with everything that happened. Okay, right. maybe she is more than just that bachelorette. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, she does understand what happened right. and how we perceived it. Mm -hmm. yeah, see, I've never known Rach to be anything other than a fierce warrior. So, whatever. All right, let's take a break <laughs> real quick. All right, uh, President Trump... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yesterday, I am walking, and I get okay. an alert on my phone. And it mm -hmm. says President Trump is on a recorded call talking to the Georgia Secretary of State. And I don't think that I've rushed to click anything faster. Really? There were short okay. snippets. I did not want the snippets. Okay, I listened to the whole thing. What you hear on this video, uh, on this this recorded call, it's not video, it's audio. You listen is, to the hour. Listen to the whole hour. Oh, wow. Okay. The whole hour, baby. What you hear on this call is President Trump, Mark Meadows, and others. Basically, basically, tell the Georgia Secretary of State, Georgia officials, that they need them to come up with 11,000 some odd votes. Or at least tell them to announce that they are looking for these votes in mm -hmm. order to overturn the election in Georgia. Mm -hmm. What you hear is the president repeatedly attempt to coerce, to intimidate, uh, and really to belittle these election officials down there into thinking that their entire system is flawed, that their entire system is wrong, and that they need to do something to rectify it, or deal with the fallout from the American people, a.k.a. the Trumpers. 
Did you listen to the call? What did you think? Yeah, I didn't listen to the whole hour, but I definitely heard the highlights. And I, it's 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 crazy to me because just when you think he's he's done, okay, he's accepted. You've tried to do this in the court system. You've been turned down, even by the same, you know, uh, Supreme Court justices that you put into office. They are refusing to hear anything that has to do with the election. You know, there are federal judges who you put into office, who you appointed, who are not, who are turning down the lawsuits that are being filed by your attorneys. You have tried absolutely everything. So I'm thinking, okay, he's accepted it. He's done. Maybe he'll run in 2024. And then this happens. And the thing is, Van, there's no way he didn't know that that call was being recorded, right? They knew that that call was recorded, yet he still truly didn't care and threatened this government official said whatever he wanted to say throughout all these allegations just because he doesn't want to lose. It's almost like if I say it enough, maybe somebody will start to believe me. It's if exactly I what keep it is. saying it, it'll it'll get like I if I keep saying it, it has to be true. Because the crazy thing is, he'll say, well, it's based on what I've heard. He won't say it's evidence that that we have. It, it, he won't say it's anything that he can prove. Nothing is matter of fact. It's, well, they're saying this with the machines. They're saying this with the suitcases and the stuffed ballots. They're saying this with people not watching. Or at least that's just what I've heard. It's insane. And the audacity that this is the president of the United States still currently, and this is how he's acting. I mean, Ben, you can't make this stuff up. He's, I, I was listening to Morning Joe this morning. And they were saying it. He's dumb as rocks. Like it's beyond, it's not even a pride thing. He's just stupid. Hmm. So he's just stupid. I can't. It's you, you're right. You're I, right. And, and, and 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 so is half of America, obviously, because they voted for him. Ooh. So I mean, what what do you say with that? What do you say, Van? And, and and this is the question I guess I have. How do you reason this? Because this isn't the first time we've heard Trump on tape admitting to something that in public he denies and he lies about. Now here you are saying these false things, these allegations that you know not to be true and you're doing it all over again, but you still have people who are supporting you. You still have a number of senators and people in Congress that are trying to basically take down our system, the democratic system to uphold things that they know not to be true just so they can back you. I mean, how do you reason this kind of thing when there's all this evidence that shows that President Trump is a certain way, yet you're still supporting him? I, I, don't, I, I don't understand it. Well, a couple of things. Number one is I think most people think that President Trump is a liar, but he's, right? not, he's not that. He's not a liar. He is a mythomaniac. Hmm. And there is a difference a liar is someone who manipulates the truth and fact in order to have it gain or benefit them in some way. Mm -hmm. A mythomaniac is someone, loose degree, excuse me, loose definition of this. A mythomaniac is someone who actually believes their lies. One person is sinister, the other person is completely dangerous. All right. I think, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. despite whatever musings we've heard before, uh, despite what things are going on behind the scenes, and we've heard President, that President Trump is blowing up at Kushner. We've heard that President Trump thought that the election was in peril. I think that President Trump's cult of personality has so arrested him that he believes these things are true. I believe that too, that he thinks that. Um, let me tell you why that's so specifically dangerous. It's so specifically dangerous is because mm -hmm. it's much easier to fight for the truth than it is to fight for a lie. Mm -hmm. See, you're only going to go so far for a lie because at some point, the lie isn't going to be worth it. You're only going to go so far for a lie. At some point, you're going to look at the lie and you're going to be like, am I risking all of this about something that isn't true? This isn't true. That's mm -hmm. not true, should I say. But for the truth, most people go to the ends of the earth. 
most people are going to go as far as they possibly can for something that they think is real. Right. Intellectually, President Trump might not believe these things are true. But emotionally, he has convinced himself, he has convinced himself that these things actually have happened. He is arrogant enough to believe that he can't lose. Yes. So if he lost, there must be something afoot. <laughs> and whatever you tell me is afoot, I'll believe it. Right. Whatever you say is wrong, I'll believe it. He continuously glosses over the fact that these people down in Georgia who are not the best people, who have purged voter rolls and, you know, sort of been a part of their own voter shenanigans for a long time, okay? But he continuously dismisses the information that they have, like you said, to talk about things that he heard. Mm -hmm. Ain't no heard. We're talking about American <laughs> democracy. Right. Either you have evidence or you don't. So, because of the conversation that I heard, I think we have a very precarious three weeks ahead of us. Okay. If, in fact, the door is shut on President Trump January 5th or 6th, whenever the Senate and Congress convene to certify the election, mm -hmm. I'm not to a large degree, but there is some part of me that is genuinely concerned about what President Trump's political death rattle is going to entail. Okay. As we speak, or a couple of days before now, before this, there were B-52s flying over Iran in a show of strength as we needle each other. You've had most former secretaries of defense come out and condemn the president. It's an interesting thing that they did that. It's worrisome. It's almost like they're trying to wave a flag or, you know, sound an alarm right. about something. Um, I'm, not I'm not too concerned about this, mm -hmm. but I am concerned that he thinks, especially with this tape surfacing, that he'll go to jail. Yeah. Definitely fearful of a lawsuit. Um, and that he's going to go crazy. So who knows? If I can tell you one thing, it was comedy. It was a <laughs> lot of comedy on that tape. But more than anything, I got the sense of someone who is afraid, who is confronted maybe for the first time in a long time that his lies might not be true, that his myth might be actually a myth. Mm -hmm. And what do you hold on to when you realize that your truth is a lie? Like, what do you do? You, We're going to find out. You do what you've been doing these next couple of days. You do what you do as, as long as you have power. You hold on to that. It, it's just crazy. It's just crazy you can say things out your mouth that say, I love this country and I'm fighting for America and I'm about the people, but then you do things that underline public faith or I mean undermine public faith in, in the electoral system, just like you did with the public health system, which is part of the reason we're in the re where we are now with COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's crazy. I'm you just scared me. You're scared? No, well, after listening to you talk, I, I read that about, you know, um, former secretary of secretaries of defense coming forward because they don't know what he is going to do. Um, that, but now hearing you say it, it scares me. Let me tell you what you got to do when you feel scared, okay? Let me tell you what you got to do when you feel scared. You got to put your hand over your heart. And you got to call on the name of Jesus. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta hit your knees and you gotta say, Jesus Christ in heaven, Lord, I'm putting my future in your hands. I am right here, Lord. I open my heart. I open my soul up to who you are. Listen, I'm telling you, I've been calling on Jesus. Y'all, look, it's a lot of people listening. It's like, Van, why are you bring religion to the podcast? Look, I've been going crazy. I've been going crazy mentally. So I've been calling on Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. 
it, well, you think there's nothing wrong with it, but people are going to be like, oh, man, like, though, why are you telling them? I've been calling on Jesus. You and can do it. It's, it's not wrong with you being open about your faith and what you believe. It's, it's weird when Jesus answers. That's the funny part. Because you'll call on Jesus and you'll talk, and then you'll be like, hey, man, what's up? And you'll be like, oh, what's going on? That's how he sounds to me. That's, That's how, how it sounds to you? Sound. He yeah. sounds different to everybody else. Can I be honest he, with you? How does Jesus sound to you? Tell it, me Jesus. Give me your Jesus voice. When you call on him, he answers. What does he sound like? Rachel. Ooh. <laughs> Rachel. Wait, wait, wait. Can mm. I be honest with you? When you said you got to close your eyes, mm -hmm. I, I thought you were going to be like, and you got to call on Moe's Bergman. <laughs> Moe's Bergman. Hey, That's I, I'll be honest with you. you I got to be honest with you. It's one of the two. I was like, okay. Moe's Bergman. See, we should probably send Moe's Bergman to deal with Trump. Look, the thing, the most, seriously though, what we can, the, the most we can hope for is that there is a, um, a peaceful transition of power and a transition of power uh, that America can build on. I mean, the President Trump has already already cost us so much in terms of um, our readiness and you know foreign affairs by not having an orderly transition to right. the Biden Harris administration. Hopefully, that hasn't hamstrung them to the degree that we don't we don't hit the ground running uh, when they take over on the twentieth. Because the reality is. Uh, there's a lot to be done. So hopefully there's enough there. Um, I will say, though, that uh, that to the Republicans, and I'm sure there's some Republicans that listen to the podcast, um, you're getting exactly what you deserve. Kemp in Georgia, all of the Republicans that took their patriotism, that took hmm. their decency, that took uh, their conscience and uh, tucked it deep within themselves for a political gain. The backstabbing that you're getting right now, ha being publicly flogged by a whiny brat who happens to reside in the White House, uh, White House, the White House, <laughs> you deserve that. Yeah. And for the ones that are going to continue with this charade, Ted Cruz, Hawley, the rest of you guys that are going to get into all of these theatrics here this week. Your time is coming too when a knife gets dug into your back and then twisted at all because this has nothing to do with partisan politics. This has to do with whether or not you're willing to put America where it should be, which is ahead of your personal political goals. So President Trump is actually doing the world a service in that he's exposing everyone who's completely politically full of shit. Now, some of you That's are so true. deep into this that you're not going to see it no matter what. But there is another group of people who are watching this who may be less tied to either side. And hopefully they'll see that lacking conviction and lacking sort of any sense of decency and whatever. Hopefully they'll see that that makes poor leaders. Mm. You would hope so, Van. I feel like the people, the senators who are being outspoken, the members of, of um, Congress or just the GOP that are being outspoken are people who have political aspirations to run for president. And that's what they're doing right now is trying to hold on to the 70 million people that voted for Trump. And that's why they're continuing with the charade. So it's it's great to be hopeful that they would see, you know, the light and to do what's right. But they've already shown their hand and how they're acting right now by undermining our democracy with these charades. It is what it is. And they'll carry it into their run for presidency and for 2024. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Kevin Durant. You see this? He's out. COVID no, I didn't see this. He got it again? They say maybe it's contact tracing or something like that. I don't think he's symptomatic, but he's out. He's going to miss some time. COVID-19. No, I didn't see that story. What Sorry, you, I missed what that are you, one. What, did you, uh, you, what are your thoughts? Um, I hope that, it's, that he doesn't have it, and I hope that if he does, that he gets well soon.
Okay, let's talk about the Durant thing real quick. So look, he so it, it so let's let's talk about the Durant thing. Well, you, I just want everybody to know this was not on our rundown of topics right. to talk about it. I feel like I'm being ambushed at the moment. I just want to okay. put that out let's there. Let's talk about Go the ahead. Durant thing real quick because we keep dancing around it. Let's just no, we don't keep dancing around it. We, we keep, keep dancing, dancing around, around your Durant. thoughts about Michael Jackson. That's what we keep dancing around. You want to get can, into that? We can talk. Get into we, oh, we can talk about Michael Jackson right <laughs> now. We can talk. We can talk about Michael Jackson right now, and I'm willing to suffer the slings and arrows. So you dated Durant. At Texas, right? I did not date Kevin Durant. Why do people keep telling me that you dated Durant? Uh, did Kevin tell you that? No. Aren't you friends with Kevin? Exactly. Kevin I didn't never, tell you that. No, and you're friends with Kevin. Why would I? Why I wouldn't say friends, but like we know each other. We would like we mm -hmm. DM. I know. Don't Chris Broussard me. The guy's a nice guy, and we <laughs> like <laughs> the, the guy's a nice guy. Who if you send him a DM, he'll answer. Kevin Durant's a cool guy. I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. You never dated Durant. No. Why do people think that you dated him? Because when I was on The Bachelorette, I think it was a great storyline for we're both on ABC and he was on ABC getting his first ring and I was on ABC trying to get my first ring and they knew we that we went to Texas together and we did know each other at Texas. So I think it was an interesting story because the story that ran is is insane. It was like Wait, so they lied? And I don't said know who I don't even know. Durant? I don't know who it. Do I know Kevin? Or, or knew him because I don't talk to him anymore. Absolutely. You know what I mean? We were at Texas at the same time. Texas is big, but the black community is small and we all pretty much know each other, especially mm -hmm. if you're on the scene. I knew Kevin. I hung out with Kevin for sure, but we weren't dating. No. So they just made some shit up. Well, they made up that Kevin and I were a serious, in a serious, somebody did. We were in a serious relationship and I left him to pursue my law career, which is great. For, that's a great narrative for me, but that's not true. I was even cool with Kevin when I was in law school and even after. So, you know. Well, is there, was there any romantic thing between you and Kevin Durant? <laughs> okay. All right. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, look, hey, hey, guess what? Out of people's business. All right. What is what romance? All right, what, uh, <laughs> all right. I, I could be a little bit. No, I'm not. Uh, out of people's business. Hey. Out, wait. I'm going to get out of people's business after I jumped two feet in all the way into because it. Because this is the thing. But this is different, though. God, you that's were, so long ago, though. Like, college is, were, I'm 35. You know what I mean? you were able to like, clear that up. And that's very important. I like I'm that like up. that's so long. That's like another lifetime. It is like, like Kevin lifetime. doesn't know me, and I don't know him like that anymore. I know. But. There was a whole line of questioning that I was going to go down if, in fact, you had dated Kevin in in, in, no. in Texas. No. Uh, so, but you didn't. You didn't date him. You guys never dated. You, you know, college stuff. Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, moving on from that, that's just a headline that popped up. I want to shout out somebody right now, uh, as Rachel looks semi disapprovingly at me. Um, MF Doom passed away. Now, you guys might not know who MF Doom is, but I can tell you one thing. He's a guy that if you love hip-hop, you love MF, MF Doom. So I'll just say this right now. Apparently, he had, Doom had passed away back in October. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. But his people decided just to go ahead and announce it um, a couple of days ago. It, it There's no such thing as a rapper who is... Uh, lyrically proficient and who loves hip hop who hasn't been influenced by MF Doom. So, uh, MF Doom, amazing lyricist, uh, amazing rapper. Not for everyone, not for everyone, but for the people that he is for, he was an integral part of your love for this craft and a love for that culture. Mm. Not for everybody, but for the ones who he was for. He was for them. Put it on, let it play, go for hours. The rhyme schemes are crazy. So, what kind of like like rapper is he? What like, you mean? In, in in my mind, I I think of like a Tech Nine. Is that how he was? Eh, I mean, to to that degree in terms of, I mean, the way he mixed the words up, it's difficult to describe it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's incredibly lyrical. You know, Tech Nine is he's got a flow all of his own. I guess you could say they were in the same family, 
But, you know, MF Doom would, would do things that, you know, other rappers that are super lyrical would marvel at mm-hmm. just with the way he kind of put things together. So a lot of wordplay, very, very heavy, heavy on the wordplay, all about the wordplay, you know? So I worked with some of the greatest producers, worked with Mad Lib. Uh, I remember Danger Mouse uh, and MF Doom had something. Danger Doom came out. Uh, that was like 2007 or something like that. But anyway, always on the cutting edge of hip hop, always innovative and was doing it for a very, very long time. Career that spans from the mid 90s all the way up until the time that he passed away. So rest in peace to MF Doom. The culture mourns you even still. Okay, let's take a break. Okay, uh, look. Rachel, is there anything else? You, you said you want to ask me about Michael Jackson. You want to talk about Michael Jackson right now? Let's talk about Michael Jackson. Let's Fine. talk about Michael Jackson. So, since, 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 since you feel like talking about the relationship. By the way, you just, that's a wild bombshell to me. It makes me look at everything different that the yeah. Kevin Durant thing was just made up. That's oh, that thing. story completely is fabricated as to the type of, you know, friendship that we had a relationship that we had with one another. That's like, it's, when I read it, I laughed and I, and I, and then I was like, oh my God, but I hope he doesn't think that I'm out here telling people that this is our story. Mm. You know what I mean? Interesting. But, um, God, that's such a long time ago though. But mm-hmm. one, when Van and I were, were prepping for this, this podcast and, you know, right. like you do, you do pre podcast because you're trying to see, you get your chemistry together and your flow. One of the topics that came up was, Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. And specifically, Leaving Neverland, I think, is what we were talking about. Now, I am a big Michael Jackson fan. Mm Man, you are too. Yes. So, I believe it was discussing whether or not in Leaving Neverland, what was asserted by the two gentlemen in that documentary, Mm -hmm. whether or not we believed them and whether or not it was true. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Van, we differ on what we believe from that documentary. Okay, what do you believe? I believe that one of them was not truthful and one was. So you think in the documentary, I'm assuming that you think that Wade Robeson wasn't truthful and the other gentleman was. Correct. That's how you feel. That's how I feel. And it was hard. And, 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 and y- y'all have to understand, this is hard for me. I'm a mm-hmm. person who legitimately passed out when Michael Jackson passed away. Mm-hmm. Begged my parents to pay for me to get to L.A. so I could attend the funeral. Big Michael fan. Thought he was a part of my family growing up. Um, I have a lot of memorabilia. So to accept this is hard for me. When the accusations happened before and he was in trial, didn't believe it. Found not guilty. That's what I'm going with. He was the court of law. Found him not guilty. He is innocent. But this documentary struck me in a different way. Wade, Wade sued him four years after he died for money, for money. To me, that I have to question your credibility when it comes to that. Never admitted anything. And I, and, 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 and I just want to preface this by I'm not being insensitive to anybody who is a victim of sexual abuse. We're merely talking about our what we thought watching this documentary because I feel mm-hmm. like this, is, this might hit people in a different way. I just felt like some of the things that he said didn't add up. Now, the other guy, I cannot remember his name at this point, no disrespect. I believe his entire story when it came to Michael, the kid who was in the commercials with him, who traveled with him, who no longer talks to his mother for how she handled that situation. I believe him 100%. Hmm. Here's the thing. Okay. And it's it's a uh, it's a really difficult thing, right? Yes, it is. Like this. Here's the reality. The reality is that most of the time, fandom is going to lead people to make their decisions in these situations, right? A right. lot of the time. So I've heard people make all kinds of cases, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard people make the case that. The FBI had investigated Michael Jackson for X amount of years, never found anything. You've heard that, I'm sure. Okay. I've heard yes. people talk about the fact that Michael Jackson was found innocent of this in a court of law. You know, I've heard people on the other side say that Michael Jackson settled a couple of lawsuits. 
uh, that were in, in involved. One in this, is public. We know that. One, one is public. We know it. Um, and that it, it became a running narrative in his career with different sets of children. Therefore, there must be something to it, right? Uh, and when you watch when you watch Leaving Neverland and you watch the detail by which, if you watch the detail that these things are described in, it's difficult to come away and call somebody a liar if you watch this. Here's the thing. Mm-hmm. And this is a big thing and it's an ugly thing and it's a nasty thing. There is a possibility that I am incapable of detaching from my emotional connection to Michael Jackson. Okay. That you are. That is what's happening. That I am. That is what's happening. Uh-huh. There's, and it, it's, and I'm a human being, and in being a human being, I'm inherently flawed. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a possibility that I'm at a point in my life to where I hear certain things and they just trigger joy. They trigger feelings. They I trigger get it. they trigger memories. They trigger all of these things, right? And there's something about other guys that doesn't exist with this. Mm-hmm. Like right away, I see Bill Cosby and I go, no. Right away, I see R. Kelly and I go, no. There's something different with Michael Jackson. Um, first of all, you don't see or hear him a lot. But when I hear Michael Jackson's music or when I see Michael Jackson, people posting him, for some reason, I don't have the reflex that says disgusting, terrible, get away from it. Okay. Um, as far as whether or not what was on Finding Neverland is true or not, it's difficult to say that it isn't true because you have to re-examine the way you look at any victim and their story if you were to if you were to stand out, you know, on that ledge. But the scarier thing is, and the thing that I have to like confront as a man and as a person and as someone who wants to see everyone do well, is what if it doesn't matter if it's true to me? That's, that's a problem. What if it, what does that mean? What does that say about me? What does that say about the way I view, what does that say about us? Like, because if, if in fact you, if you listen to those stories, you look, you listen to stories of kids that were meticulously and intentionally groomed over a period of time and then had this big thing sprang on them. Well, in the same way that they were falling in love with Michael Jackson being right next to him, I was falling in love with Michael Jackson because he seemed a million miles away. He seemed to be representative of this sort of stardom, this excellence, this blackness, and this feeling. Michael Jackson isn't a person. He's a feeling. Like, you get you see him spin around and you feel like, Jesus Christ, I'm alive. You hear him go, hee hee, and you think, do everybody, the people that will, the people that are still listening, that, that, are, that are still listening to the music, there's, a, there's an experiment that you can do for this. There's a song called Can You Feel It on the Jackson's album. And I'm getting chills right now, right? There's a song called Can You Feel It? Now, if, this is a test. I, I use this as an emotional test and I have for a long time. The song comes on. Doom, 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 and, and then Jermaine comes in. Everywhere. And it's fine. You're like, fine. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? And then all of a sudden, Michael Jackson comes in and goes, children in the world to be and you like Jesus Christ and like there is a chasm of difference what you just heard you were grooving there's a chasm of difference between what you just felt and what you're feeling now 
And it's like, for me personally, I get it. I could even step back and go, yo, I'm wrong, but it's, it's, it almost makes you feel disgusting. And, and I'm not saying that, by the way, I've made up my mind on any of it. I'm saying that I'm operating off the fact that if it were true, and I knew for 100%, not whether or not I would still support the music or not whether or not I would still do any of that stuff, because it's not like I listen to Michael Jackson a lot right now. I don't. Um, hardly ever. But the question is if that feeling would go away. So this is the thing. And, and, and that's why I was like, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I'm, you know, not regarding the, you know, Wade's story. Um, I just have issues with some of the things that I, that I saw, you know, when I, when I watched it. But I think what, I understand what you're saying about separating the music and what Michael meant to you growing up versus what you start learning as an adult or the, the accusations that you're hearing as an adult. You mentioned Bill Cosby. For me, Cliff Huxtable is somebody who's totally different from Bill Cosby because I grew up watching the Huxtables. I grew up thinking I was a part of their family. So then to learn the person behind Cliff Huxtable, that character is this monster. It's hard for me. When I see the Cosby show come on, I I can't help but think of what Bill Cosby is when I watch that. And it takes something away from me. And when I listen to Michael's music, I still listen to it, you know, if it, if, you know, from time to time, because it gives me that same joy. But in my mind, I think of the things that I know now, because one of the things that really got to me in that documentary. I wish you say that the young man's name is James Safechuck. It's Wade Robinson and James Safechuck. So yes. James Safechuck is let's is name the one him. whose story really, really resonated with me. Mm-hmm. Um I one of the things that got to me was when we were kids. Or I was a kid when the OJ verdict was dropped and when he was accused of being guilty, um, accused of um, the murder and then found not guilty. I didn't, was too young to understand the gravity of everything that was going on. I just saw this black man being accused of murdering a white woman and, and, and it was OJ and what he represented to the community. And I was like, he's not guilty. Now as an adult, I've seen it a totally different way. And I'm like, oh my gosh, OJ was absolutely involved with that. As a child, when Michael was accused of molesting um, the child, the one he ended up settling with, it was like, oh, he settled. You know, he just wanted to get this, this, I don't even think I understood it because it was in the early 90s. I was too young for that. To watch Never, uh, what is it? Leaving Neverland. Never leaving um, Neverland. Leaving Leaving Neverland. Neverland. To watch Leaving Neverland and to see that there were depositions that were taken in mm-hmm. regards, it's not like there was an accusation of Michael paid him off. They went through the process sure. and these depositions came out of bodyguards, drivers, maids telling these stories who were losing their entire, like putting their, their career on the line to tell their version of what they witnessed or what they saw, what they heard really stuck with me. I yeah. never knew that. I never knew that it was taken that far. And I, and like, maybe this is my, uh, me putting my attorney hat coming in, but the fact that they were deposed and they admitted those things and then the settling came, it got to me. That was new information to me. Mm-hmm. To hear this man, James, talk about how he has no relationship with his mother because his mother was accepting concert tickets and meeting these superstars, living out her best life through- She was being groomed. Her, yes, through what her son was able to give to Michael, whether it's friendship, whatever, whatever it may have been. And he no longer has a relationship with her. Mm-hmm. Let me, made me feel like, wow, like he, something happened. Something happened there for him to no longer talk to the woman who gave him birth, who he'd had a previous relationship with. It just, it just, all that, that documentary hit me in a way a deeper way than anything ever has with Michael. And it changed my perception. And I have to say, it's not that I don't get the joy. For you, it's can you feel it. For me, it's man in the mirror. You know, when that video played and that tear, that single tear rose down Desmond Tutu's face and they Mm -hmm. multiply it all those times on the screen. I used to cry watching that video as a child to see the joy people felt 
at a Michael Jackson concert. That video, that song gives me a feeling. It still does. But I think of that documentary at the same time. And I yeah. think about those individuals that were affected by Michael. I can't, I, it, and it's sad. I, I mean, I, I, I it think It takes away about, your I, innocence. I, I did. Well, my innocence has been gone. But, um, <laughs> but doesn't once again, Michael make you feel like, like a kid? No. Doesn't Michael make you feel innocent? It, you know it does it, for me. It, it did. What, it, what it made me feel, Michael Jackson felt infinite. It felt, there was, it felt like there was nothing that Michael Jackson couldn't do. Yeah, he, he was felt, a superhero. He, he felt magical. He felt uh, untouchable. He felt singularly gifted in a way that like you can't really articulate. Mm -hmm. And what you really don't want to come to terms with more than anything is that the world does have walls. Is that the way that you looked at the world mm -hmm. when you were a kid? That that's not really what it is. Mm -hmm. That there's work that has to be done to keep people safe. That there's work that, that has to be done for, to do all of this stuff. And you can't moonwalk it away. You can't spin it away. Moonwalker. And, and you can't, like, all of that stuff, right? See, there's that's a, taking away the innocence. But that's what I'm saying. That's a, yeah, I mean, like, to, to a degree, yeah, there was something that you believed about the world. And even, like, when you when you go to Disneyland and you... I remember when I, when I went to Disneyland, I went to Disneyland as a kid. I go to Disneyland and I remember feeling in a, in a weird way when I realized the castle wasn't real. That like mm -hmm. it was a statue. And you start to feel like, hey, you know, whatever. So it's hard. And by the way, there are going to be tons of people who are going to listen to this. They're going to tell us about all kinds of inconsistencies in the documentary. There are going to be other people that are going to say, hey, Michael Jackson's a monster and you're a bad person if you don't, yeah. Yeah. I am being as honest as same I possibly can be about it. Same. Glad we talked yeah. about that because that had been hanging over the head of the podcast right there. Well, a couple oh, by of the, things apparently. By uh by the way, yeah, exactly. By the way, to anyone who has survived uh uh sexual assault in any way, I realize right now that what you might have heard, parts of it, might mm -hmm. have been triggering or disappointing to you as you hear us talk about this. I'm just being as real as I can be. What I can tell you right now is despite what was just said is that I will continue in my life to be an advocate, to offer a platform for people to tell their stories, um, and also, if need be, uh, to be an avenger for them, you know, in, 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 in times. So, uh, and if you're someplace and you're, it, it's a situation, it's got to feel ridiculous if that's the guy. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just hard. It's just difficult. All right, we'll end on that. Uh, oh, oh, real quick before we go, twenty twenty was a uh, was a shit year. Do you have an unexpected ally of the year? Oh God, I forgot about this. Yes, unexpected ally of the year for twenty twenty. I mean, I don't know. Go say yours, and then maybe I'll think. About I don't it. have one. Couldn't okay, think of it. There we go. Very there upset about it. Couldn't think of an unexpected ally. We are out of here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people that did a lot of great things, but I think the unexpected ally of 2020 has to be you. You survived it. You're here. Let's make next year a better mm, year. That's great. Uh, 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 put your thing caps on. Oh, take them off. Take them off. <laughs> I'm so emotionally disheveled. Uh, take your thing caps off. Do not stop learning. I am Van Lathan. I'm Rachel Lindsay.